But we're not complete in talking about the church unless we talk about the people in it, because we learn the church is people, it's not a building. And so the first step in, in that we want to talk about is the leadership of the church. In, in Taiwan, where everybody speaks Chinese, my, my title, what people always called me, was Michael Mushi, which means Michael Priest. There's no other word in Chinese for the person who is the, the, the leader of a church congregation. Now, we have pastor, minister, uh, we have parson, we have, we have all these kind of words uh, other than priest, and then we have this word priest as well. And I wasn't always thrilled with that because the Chinese word mu shi means priest in the very specific meaning that this person is required for you to get your message to God. You see, even the English word priest has this idea that you are not worthy of talking to God. He's too busy. He's too powerful. He's too holy. You need a human being who's just better than you who's been sanctified in a special way, cleansed in a certain way, who wears the, the special clothes and the funny hat and has the rings. And I'm not picking on Catholics here because they are not alone in that by any means. It seems that often you get some educated, good-looking guy who thinks I'm the head of the church, and he starts acting a little big on himself. And new Christians who have this idea well, he knows the Bible better than me. He must be closer to God than I am. And you start thinking, I need him in order to pray. I need him in order to baptize. I need him in order to bless the Lord's Supper. Uh, and folks, I, I'm not nearly as good as some of you. It's not, there are a couple of people here a whole lot better than me. I just happen to have gone to school to learn this stuff. Well, okay, yeah, maybe I, I spend a lot of my time praying and meditating and contemplating God, but do you know what that does for me as far as getting closer to God than those of you who maybe don't read your Bible every day or pray every day? This puts me about this much higher because the righteousness of man is like filthy rags compared to the glory of God. I'm a guy. And I hate being called musher or priest. Some days I'm not even fond of the word pastor, except pastor just means, you know, shepherd, farmer. Yeah, I, I know how to lead the cattle to feed and shovel things. <laughs> the, the, the book of Proverbs says, where the cattle are working, there will be stuff that happens. <laughs> And the meaning of that passage is, in a church that's actually doing what the Lord wants, there's going to be some messiness. And that messiness has to be cared for. It has to be cleaned up. It has to be looked at after people who have been appointed to just say, hey, we need to stop and clean this up. And we find this all throughout the Old Testament as well. When Moses was told, you can't do all this by yourself, appoint 50 men. And under them, another 50 men until the whole nation is cared for one guy at a time. If this guy can't take care of it, he raises it up to the next level. But those guys aren't holy. They're just managers, servants. In the book of Judges, when Israel had no king and no leader and no priest, and they did what was ever right in their own eyes, they continually fell into sin and messiness. And God would have to raise up a judge. <clears throat> and we know from reading the story of Samson, who was a judge of Israel, those judges weren't any more holy than anybody else. They were just appointed to the job. I learned this when I was able to do geometry better than my geometry teacher. She knew geometry because she'd been teaching it for years. But once I got the assignment, I could do it better than she did. Because I was arrogant. But she told me, Michael, you've got a talent that I've never had. I've just got the experience you don't. It's not a matter of being better. It's just a matter of saying, you fit the job. You're in the right place and at the right time in your life. This is what church leadership is. Not a hierarchy of holiness, but an organization to clean up the messiness. 
Alexander Campbell, in his Christian System, talks about the four points of biblical leadership. He says that officers are necessary for coordination. Not to make things more holy, not to make things more righteous, but when you get a number of people together that want to spend money on something, you just got to have some mediation, don't you? Because some people want blue carpet and some people want green carpet. You got to have somebody that just hits the gavel and says, okay, let's call this meeting to order. Otherwise, chaos. And so, for organizational purposes, churches need officers. And then he says, to do that, you select the best for the job. Not the most popular, not even the person who's been here the longest, but the person who's best for the job. What's the job? Well, we need the carpet cleaned. Well, who's a good carpet cleaner? It's not Pastor Michael because I don't clean anything. <laughs> I don't mean that because I'm haughty. It's because I'm just sloppy. Who's best for the job? Third, you set them apart for office. That means if you're going to appoint them to that office, you give them the authority. You don't second guess them. You don't sit there and say, you know what, uh, I think I could do it better. Well, then you should have run for office. Give them the authority. Give them the rope to hang them. I mean, uh, give them the authority to get things done. And then finally he says, then these people must give themselves fully to the work they're called to. It's a two-way street, he's saying. You give them the authority, you give them the title, but they better be doing the job. They'd better be saying, hey, my whole life's going to be poured into this job you've given me. This, this was his four points of what we look for in church leaders. And as this church next week votes on church leaders, it's something to think about. Right person for the job, will they pour themselves into it? He says in that chapter, persons may be juniors in years and seniors in Christ. Now, why does he write that? You see, our Bible, translating into English these Greek words, sometimes we get a certain word that we've translated a certain way, but we think of it differently later. Like the word elder. You know, how many of you, when you first started going to church, thought the word elder meant older than you? You know? And I've heard this in many church, many, many churches when we nominate somebody to the eldership and someone will say, well, they're not old enough. Well, how old is old enough? Well, older than me. But you see, Timothy is told, don't look in, let anybody look down upon you because of your age. And Thomas Campbell, the founder of the Disciples of Christ, said the apostles ordained elders in every church. They did not make young men into old men, but set apart those who were seniors in the Lord to the office of overseers, which we translate as elders. They did not make juniors into seniors, but they made the mature of the Lord into bishops of the church. This word that we have in Greek that we translate as elder can be bishop, overseer, leader, pastor. But we get fixated on this word elder, and we think that it's this certain kind of person in the church who is physically older. And he's saying that when we look at the Bible in the Greek, its original languages, what we get is this title, bishop, which we don't like to use because that might remind us of some other denomination. It's an overseer. It's a person that oversees the church. And sometimes they were a little bit younger than some of the church members, and sometimes they were a little bit older. But the issue was, how mature in Christ are they? And that doesn't have to do anything with the number of years they've gone to church. It has to do with their service. Are they leading Bible studies? Are they bringing people to Christ? Do they know their scriptures? Do they share the scriptures? How do we perceive them? Because here's the thing. We may elect elders by checking a box. God appointed elders before we ever nominated them. And how do we see them? 
they doing now? What are they doing now before anybody ever said to them, hey, I got a job for you. You look in, a, in, in jobs when you're trying to find the right worker, you kind of look for people who've already got the education and have already got the skills, don't you? I, I read an article yesterday that said that several businesses now have done this new thing where they interview this guy coming in or this girl coming in. Maybe they're at a desk job. Maybe they're accounting or business management. And they're doing this. They're saying, okay, we just bought this seven-shelf wall unit from Ikea, and we want you to put it together for us. Huh? It does two things. First of all, it looks to see if they can follow directions. Because <laughs> have you ever seen Ikea directions? Ugh. And second, are you going to say that's not your job? Or are you going to say, yeah, let me, get, let me tackle that. Let me look at that. Because if you say it's not my job, you might not be qualified for the job. You jump in, you get the job done, you work. Let's look at what's said in Scripture about leaders in the church. And he, that's Jesus, he personally gave some to be apostles, some to be prophets, some evangelists, some pastor teachers for the training of the saints in the work of ministry to build up the body of Christ. We have four people here. Apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastor teachers. Now, your translation might say pastors and teachers. But the Greek only has one word here. That means pastor teacher. But you can't say that in English really well. So some translations say pastors and teachers. Some of your newer translations will say pastoring teachers or teaching pastors because that's the word we've got these four people who are they what do these words actually mean because it's my opinion that most churches have taken these words that nobody knows and put their own definitions into them that don't hold up to study like this word apostle now you might have grown up in the church thinking that there are no more apostles that only the first 13 guys were apostles. 13 because of Paul. But then we find out, well, John, who wrote the book of John, I'm sorry, I, I can't think. James, who wrote the book of James, he's called an apostle, and he wasn't one of the original apostles. Well, there's 14 right there. We aren't re really clear on this word apostle sometimes. Apostle means missionary and church planter. You thought it meant something bigger than that, didn't you? Now, I never went around in Taiwan or India or anywhere else saying that I was an apostle because that's just a little presumptuous in the way people talk. But the word apostle is the same root word as the word angel. Evangelios. And it means one who takes the message of the gospel from God and to the people. The word apostle is what we would think of as modern missionaries today. They are independent pioneers. They are doing all the jobs. When you get a missionary on the field or out in Kansas somewhere and they're there to start a church, how many elders do you have? How many deacons do you have? <laughs> Nothing. And so the apostle generally, as we see in the book of Acts, is going and he's doing all the work to get a church started. And then what does Paul do when he's got the church started and he elects elders? He leaves. Unfortunately, today we've got just the opposite. Missionaries stay in one place forever and pastors move around churches every couple of years. Then we have prophets. What's a prophet? Most of you will think of prophets as this guy that tells the future. Well, you look in the Bible and prophets were always telling the future. No, they weren't. Only about 10% of anything a prophet in the Old Testament says was the future. 90% of what he said was today. Here's what the Lord God of Israel tells you today. The word prophet means preachers and theologians. The people that focus on God's word and almost nothing else. 
They are there to tell you what God is saying to you. And in the New Testament, that becomes the skilled and gifted communicators of the Bible. And, and I had a pastor in Arizona actually say to his congregation that he was a pastor, and, and Michael Haggard, he's more of a prophet. Oh, gee, thanks, well, I guess. What he was trying to say was, Michael's not very good at pastoring. <laughs> well, I'd have to agree with him, folks. I, I'm, I'm really good at communicating the Word of God. I'm not always real good about coming and calling on you. I, I sometimes kind of like to be in my man cave. <laughs> but this is an important point. This confession that I'm giving you right now is an important point that we're going to talk about later. Prophets are preachers and theologians. Evangelists, what do they do? They're the outreach. These are the people that are excited about going out and meeting people who have not heard of Jesus or they don't believe in Jesus or they've rejected Jesus. The evangelists are the ones that are very, very good about loving their neighbors. And then this word, they are good apologists. Now, that does not mean to say, I'm sorry, I'm a Christian. <laughs> the Greek word apology means to give a good argument, to convince somebody of your position. That's what true apology is, which we think is just the opposite. We think if you're trying to justify your position, you're not really apologizing. So it's kind of confusing. Evangelists love to go, they love to do VBS, not in the building, but out in the park. They love to do block parties. They love to have dinner parties. They love to just spend time at the reading room, at the library, with people, getting to know them, and eventually telling them about Jesus. And I would say that in modern America, this is actually quite rare. We're all kind of scared of... Uh, Facebook has been great for us because we can meet people without ever meeting them. We can yell at people without ever meeting them. <laughs> And then finally, the pastoring teachers, or the teacher pastor. These are your ministers and elders. Get that? It's not that the pastor is one thing and the elder is something different. In Scripture, elders and the pastor are the overseers of the church. It, now, if you like the word bishop, that's fine. I've been wanting to call, you know, Don Bishop... Bishop Jansen for a long time. But that's what they are. The overseers of the church. The shepherds of the flock of the church. Now some of you might be looking at this list and thinking, okay, I, I've heard of apostles, but I didn't know we had any. We do. I know what prophets are, but I didn't think we had those anymore except the weird guys on TV. Well, those are exactly not what we're talking about. And evangelists, well, I kind of knew that. Pastors and teachers, I got that. Fully understand that. But I'm a deacon, and where's that on the list? That's a good question. What about deacons? They're in the Bible, but they're not in this list that Paul gives of appointments. You see, the list that Paul gave in Ephesians, Jesus gave some to be apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastoring teachers. Those are what God has appointed through talents, through gifts. I hate to say this to any deacon that's going to get offended, but deacons are appointed by the church. <gasps> deacon wasn't actually an office that was appointed by Jesus. In the book of Acts, the apostles are studying the Word of God, they're preaching, they're evangelizing, they're acting like uh, missionaries. But then you've got widows in the church who can't eat because in that culture, they first of all, as women, they weren't allowed to do business. And second, as Christians, they weren't getting jobs. And so the apostles were taking care of them as well. And it was getting to where they were just too busy until it was decided, pick some young men to wait tables. My grandfather always called deacons waiters. <laughs> pick these guys and have them take care of the widows so that the apostles could spend their time studying the Word of God and preaching. The word deacon, diakonos, means servant, slave, or waiter. So, you know, from now on, when some of the deacons come by to take the offering, you can say, thank you, slave. 
But these are willful servants, not slaves in the sense of someone captured in battle, slaves in the sense of someone that says, look, I want to serve this household voluntarily. These people take care of the physical and practical ministry of the church. Have you cleaned out the coffee pot here? You're a deacon. Just We just haven't declared it to be fact. You ever mop the floor here? That's a deacon service. The problem is, is that we also elect deacons. We appoint them and we give them that title. But really, it's not an office. It's an appointed service. We have things that have to be done regularly, like building and grounds. We have one man in this church who is both an elder and a deacon because he's building and grounds, which are physical parts of the building being taken care of. But we don't call him a deacon because we have this idea, well, he's an elder, that's higher than deacon. No, it's not. Which one's higher, the plumber or the electrician? If you want to be an electrician, you got to be a plumber first, and then you're a junior electrician, and then later you'll be an electrician. Deacons are not junior elders. Deacons are deacons, and they have a God-given job to get things done physically. And elders have a God-given job to get things done spiritually. And there is no dishonor to be one or the other. It's a calling. One's called by God and one's called by the church, which is the body of Christ under the head of Christ, so you might as well call it God called. Acts chapter 6, it would not be right for us to give up preaching to handle financial matters. Select from among you seven men of good reputation, full of the spirit and wisdom, whom we can appoint to this duty. But we will devote ourselves to prayer and to the preaching, teaching ministry. You know, folks, I, I might have a sermon on giving, and I might have some ideas about how the church should use its money, but when it comes to actually signing checks or handling things or knowing what you gave, I actively don't care. <laughs> because that's the job of this body, not the job of the pastor. Well, pastor, you probably know what I give. No, I have no clue what you give because I don't look. Deacons, they get to look at that and, you know, they can judge you. <laughs> that's a joke, by the way. You know, they should be judged. <laughs> And so he gave some to be apostles and prophets, some to be evangelists, some to be pastors and teachers. Well, Michael, you just admitted that you're more prone towards just preaching and you're not really prone towards the pastoring part. So why did we hire you as the pastor? Well, you see, this is talking about gifts, that God gave gifts to certain people. Some people are very, very gifted at going out, starting churches. Some people are very gifted at going out and just bringing individual people to Christ. Some people are very gifted at public speaking and making the Bible understandable. And some people are very gifted at pastoring. Folks, I am not gifted at pastoring, I'll tell you that. It was not one of the spiritual gifts God gave me. I had to go to school and sweat and learn how to do that. But man, I was preaching before I got to Bible college. That's the difference between gifts and learning. Because there's nothing on here. Oh, wait, there is something on here about learning. Why does God appoint apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers? For the training of the saints in the work of ministry. The reason I don't like being called a priest or a pastor is because I got a church full of pastors who don't actually need me, except for one thing, teach you how to preach. Somebody taught me how to pastor. Someone else taught me how to evangelize. And someone else taught me how to go and church plant. But I'm not gifted at those things. You see, here's what happens for some people. The preacher stands up here and says, you all need to go and tell your neighbors about Jesus Christ. And somebody comes up to me later and says, now, Michael, I know that the church needs to tell people about Jesus, but I don't because I wasn't gifted in sharing the gospel. I was gifted in praying for people. 
And so that since that's my gift, God doesn't call me to do anything else. He only calls me to pray for people. That is not Scripture. You were given the gift that you have, whether it's the gift of praying for people, the gift of evangelizing, the gift of preaching. For what purpose? To equip the saints. Who are the saints? You are the saints. If you don't know how to preach, come see me. I will be happy to give up a Sunday for you and say, folks, John Phillips says he wants to preach a sermon. But you see, I won't just say, out of the blue, I'll say, we've spent the last several weeks talking about how sermons are written and delivered. That's my job, is to teach. Some of you are much better at... I, I praise God for Bishop Jansen. Because, man, I'll tell you, if it was up to me to go every Friday to go calling in the nursing homes, I'd get busy and forget. His job as an elder and an overseer is to say to the pastor, you're going with me. Amen? That's right. We are here to build each other up. We are here to sharpen each other's swords. We are here to equip each other with the gifts we have. And you may say, but you know what? I'm still not very good about standing up here and talking. That's okay. You're not required to stand up here and talk. But what day might come where the Lord calls you to and you haven't taken advantage of the other people in the room that can help you stand up and talk? The Lord may never call you to go calling at the nursing home, but what happens on the day when the church says to you, I really need you to do this for me, and you haven't taken advantage of spending time with somebody who goes? And you elders, are you elders forever? Grab somebody who's not an elder and say, come do this elder thing with me so you can see how it's done. You deacons, are you going to be deacons forever? No. Grab a teenager and says, here's how we deacon things. Teach each other. Build up each other. Don't assume that the pastor is always going to be the preacher or that the pastor is always going to be there. My goodness, I've got... I got a bad kidney. I might be in the hospital some Sunday and they call on you to preach. Whoa, are you, have you got a sermon ready? <laughs> servants made by servants are servants of servants. Listen to that again. Servants who were made, chosen, elected by servants are servants of servants. I do not want a church where there's some people that are very, very high and some people that are servants. Oh, Pastor Michael, let me do that for you. No. The biggest argument we should ever have is you first. No, 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 you first. No, 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 you first. Let me help you with that. No, 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 let me help you with that. No, 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 let me help you with that. Servants of servants. But then he goes on to say something a little confusing. He says, and such are all the clergy of the man of sin. By ourselves, by ourselves, electing officers, we will eventually have a clergy who thinks they're better than everybody else. The pastor who goes down to get a haircut and says, yeah, but you know, I'm the pastor. I should get a discount. Where the, the authority goes to their head. The elder who says, I've been an elder of this church for blah, 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 and you should blah, 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 blah. I'm an elder. Servants of servants, without God, become entitled. But the body of Christ, under Him as its head, animated and led by the Spirit, is the fountain and spring of all official power and privilege. Your leaders need to be slaves of Christ. Always. And so finally, bishops teach. 
They preside. They execute the laws of the church. Deacons, composed of stewards, treasurers, doorkeepers, etc., as the case may require, wait continually upon its various services. Its evangelists, ordained and consecrated to the work of the Lord in converting sinners and planting churches, are constantly engaged in multiplying members. This is the leadership of the church. Servants, made by servants, to serve servants. Always multiplying the members of the church. Some of us have talents. We're supposed to use those talents to teach each other so that all of us are eventually making new members. What's a member? Is it because I wrote a name on a card that I'm a member? No. What's a member? I'll tell you next week. You got to come next week to find out what a member is. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, I pray that everyone that is called by the name of Christ is growing and maturing into leadership, that you are showing them their talents, that they are leaders of different things. Some are leaders of speaking. Some are leaders of teaching. Some here know that they are leaders in different ways, in different talents, but Lord, may your Spirit help them pursue students, members of the church who want to learn how to Do what you've gifted others to do. Lord, help us to always remember that we are servants and slaves to the Lord Jesus Christ and to each other. And that no one is above any other except what office we give them for a limited time for the purpose of serving, not lording over each other. Lord, bless us in this endeavor. In Jesus' name, amen. Jesus said to his apostles,